Y'all ready? Let's begin. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to read verses 6 through 18 this morning. I'm not going to cover all of this this morning, but for context, I'm going to read these verses. I have seven points, and I could only get through two of them in the first service. So we are going, this is going to be a little bit of a series. Um, and you should be happy because I had them, you know, I didn't do seven. Amen. <laughs> but let's read verses 6 through 18 this morning. God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect, because the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is even more glorious. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech, unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, being, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Father, I thank you for instructing us this morning. Guide my thoughts and my words. Let what I say be clear. And Lord, give us a heart that apprehends what is being taught and let us grow in the knowledge of you, Lord. For this is written to Christians. But it is for their edification and for their growing in that knowledge. And I ask it today for everyone in this room, Lord, that our faith might be firm in whom we have believed. And I give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Paul established the church in Acts. He's been away from it for some time. He planted that church. When he left... Obviously, some men came with letters, uh, probably from Jerusalem. And they had these letters, and they were commending themselves by these letters, saying, Paul had some things wrong, and we want to straighten, him, straighten it out. And these men were most assuredly Judaizers. That is to say that they believed in Jesus as the Messiah. They believed he died on the cross. They believed he was raised from the dead. But they believed that what he did was not sufficient for salvation. That you had to follow all the law as well in order to be justified before God. They were telling all of these Gentiles that they had to be circumcised. I mean, you know, that's no fun for a membership class. <laughs> and... Uh, they were saying not only have to be circumcised, at this time when Paul writes this letter, the temple in Jerusalem was still up and running. So there were still animal sacrifices going on in the temple. Paul says that all of this is passing away that's of the old covenant. And what is of the new covenant is uh, remaining and permanent. That which has to do with Christ and his church. And Paul is going to write here that it is not what is written in this Bible, in ink, that ultimately matters if the Holy Spirit does not take it and write it on your heart. That it has to be a work of the Holy Spirit. And if we try to find 
uh, our justification before God in the works of the law, all of us fall short. Amen? And so today I want to talk about the glory of the new covenant as opposed to the glory of the old covenant, which comes from Moses. The glory of the new covenant is expressed here. He, he contrasts it between the old covenant and the new. And he speaks to how the new covenant is better, far superior than the old covenant. And we're going to get into that a little bit. And I think I'm more persuaded reading this passage that Paul penned the book of Hebrews. You read Hebrews chapter 8 and it's very similar to this passage. Um, or at least one of Paul's close contemporaries penned Hebrews. Because all of Hebrews is about how what we have in Christ is better than what they had with Moses. And so here he begins and I want to Start in verse 6, he says here, God has made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. The first benefit of the new covenant is it's geared to give you life. It's geared to give you life. It is not geared to kill you. How many of you know religion kills? But what we have in Christ gives life. Jesus says the thief comes, not but to still kill and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. The Bible says whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We come to church because we have been promised life in Christ. This is not going to end poorly for us in death. But it ends in life. The old covenant was meant to kill and to slay and condemn because it was a covenant of works. And these Judaizers, they came into the church and they said, yes, Jesus is the Messiah, but he's just here to re reinforce what Moses said. The real lawgiver is Moses, not Jesus. Paul speaks of the new covenant here, though. And you've got to know a little bit of Jewish history in the Bible to know what he's talking about. I'm going to try to clarify today a little bit of that. But you go over to Jeremiah chapter 31, and in the writings of the law and the prophets, we see a prediction of more to come. That the old covenant isn't a closed covenant but that there's more progressive revelation of who God is and what He's doing to come in Christ. Do you understand? So in the Old Covenant, we look in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 through 34, and it says, and this is the definition of the New Covenant, or our salvation as Christians. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Paul is going to say that in the old covenant, it was a good starting point, but there was more to come. And that, old, that the old covenant pointed to something more in, in the Messiah that was going to come, the new covenant. You remember over in uh, Luke's gospel, chapter 22, Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took the cup and he says, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do you all remember that? Jesus is assigning to himself the new covenant and what he did on the cross as the new covenant versus the old. The old covenant is good. It's the law. 
the Ten Commandments, and all that goes with it. But it is insufficient if it's not pointing us to a Savior. Jesus says in John chapter 5, verse 39, You search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but these are which testify of me. Basically, what Paul's going to say is that everything in the Old Covenant is insufficient, falls flat on its face if it's not pointing to Jesus. And what he did, the Old Covenant diagnoses you as a sinner. It tells you not to covet. It tells you not to lie. It tells you not to steal. And then it leaves it with you. And what happens? You fall flat on your face, don't you? Because you're not perfect, are you? The Bible says if you... Sin in one area of the law, you've broken the whole law. Did you know that you don't have to be a murderer, but you can do other stuff in order to be a bad guy? And so these Judaizers were saying, you've got to cover all the bases of the old covenant, plus what Jesus did. And when you do all of that and touch all the bases of the old covenant, then you're saved. And Paul's going to say, no. The spirit of the old covenant was to point the, to the fact that you need a Savior. Yes, the whole thing is a setup, according to Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, that the law was uh, like a tutor that brought us to Christ. It taught us that we're never going to be good enough. We're never going to be enough. And we need a Savior. Christ is the light of the Bible. And every verse... He says, speaks of him. What these Judaizers had done is they'd closed the canon. And they said, Jesus is outside of the canon now. When I say canon, I mean the Bible. Even to this day, the Jewish people believe that a Messiah will come. But they don't see all of the Old Testament pointing to the Messiah. They don't see all the types and shadows. They don't see the prophecies about the Messiah. They just see ceremonies that they've got to do in order to be Jewish. Don't eat ham. Uh, You know, celebrate these festivals and we're Jewish. This is what makes us Jewish. But it scatters them all over these little things that are not connected. The thing that connects the whole Bible is Jesus. The person. And the work of Christ is pointed to throughout the Bible. How many of you know that's true? But if it's not pointing to Christ in the Old Testament, it falls flat. And and basically what Paul is going to be saying here is that the whole law of Moses is just a door on the ground if it's not put on the hinge of Jesus Christ. The door doesn't swing without him. You understand? He's the reason for it. And it doesn't matter Old Testament or New Testament. It doesn't matter what part of the Bible. If it's not pointing you to a Savior... You're doing it wrong. If you think at any time, ultimately, that verse is pointing to you and not to him, then you're not reading it right. right. All of it finds its every command. That's why Augustine said, give what you will. I'm sorry, ask what you will, but give what you will. Give what you ask. The empowerment to serve God well comes through our relationship with Jesus Christ. What the law does, uh, it's the law of death, the Bible says here, the ministry of death. What it does is it isolates you from God. It says, look, it's all up to you. You got to be good enough or God won't like you. It's performance based. You got to do a bunch of good stuff in order for God to love you. Instead of on behalf of Christ, you're accepted right where you are, just as you are. Well, wouldn't that be true? Wouldn't that be something if that were true? What the law does, if you put your works as what really does it at the end of the day and makes you justified before God, it makes the law the mediator between you and God. But when Jesus died on the cross... There was a great earthquake, and the veil was ripped from top to bottom where we have access to God through what Jesus did on the cross. 
And we have a new mediator in Christ in the new covenant. We, the, the go between us and the presence of Almighty God is Jesus Himself and not the do's and don'ts of better stick with it. Better choose life and not death or there'll be a bunch of consequences. That's all true. That's all good. But when it's all up to a sinner like you, how many of you know you're going to get isolated? Why? Because you can't keep up with God that way. You're going to peter out at some point because you cannot keep up with a holy God when it's all up to you ultimately. So the law puts a, a veil. Moses wore a veil when he came down from Mount Sinai. Do you all remember when he said in uh, Exodus chapter 33, show me your glory, says it to God. And God passes before him, shows him his glory. He's on Mount Sinai, and God gives him the Ten Commandments on tablets of stone. This is the second pair because he broke the first time, the Ten Commandments, because he's so mad at everybody when he came down. So here's the second time. He gets the Ten Commandments. He comes down in chapter 34 from Mount Sinai, and his face is glowing because he's been in the presence of God. And it scares everybody so bad that he's got to wear a veil over his face. And there's this distance between... And the people were afraid. And they wouldn't come near him. And there's this distance that the law causes and, and the ministry of Moses caused the people always to be at a distance. They're at a distance from the ark. They're at a distance from the presence of Almighty God. They watched it. They respected it. But they did not know it personally because it was at a distance. You touch the ark and you die. But in Christ, he's tangible. He's touchable. He's personal. But the law puts this distance. It isolates people. Man, when you're trying to perform in order to be a good Christian, or you're trying to be, you're trying to do right all the time so you can be loved by others, man, ultimately you get isolated from the pack and killed by, by performance-based religion. And so the law isolates us. It separates us from God. And where there's separation, there's death. Not only does it isolate, but over in Romans chapter 7, the Bible says that the law excites our sinful nature. The law excites our sinfulness. How many of you, if I told you right now, don't think about a pink elephant? <laughs> don't think about it. How many of you not think? How many of you? Okay. <laughs> And when the law says, don't covet, don't do this, don't do that. How many of you have ever gone to church and you heard somebody preaching against something and you went out and did it? Praise God. Because there's something about forbidden fruit. Yeah. Don't eat of that one tree. There's a gajillion trees in the garden. Don't you eat of that one. Boy, oh boy, that one becomes very, you start looking at it a little bit. I remember when I, this is terrible. I can't believe I'm telling on myself because I'm very good these days. I'm very, you know, <laughs> awesome. But when I was a kid, I'd read, Proverbs, and I'd hear about this adulterous woman, and she'd make her bed, and she had all of these incenses, and she'd get the guy to kiss him. And I know I was supposed to think that's terrible, but I was thinking, boy, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> all right, I'm just telling you. <laughs> and Paul says, look, I was alive before the law came, but it slew me. It, it, uh, it killed me. Because it, it excited all of that stuff that I knew I wasn't supposed to do. It revealed to me that there is something inside of me that is sinful. It isolates, it excites, it, it exacerbates uh, the situation. It's like the law being a broom. Going into a very dusty house. It begins to dust, but you're knee deep in dust. And it just causes more problems than... Do you understand? That's the way it is with you. You're such a sinner. The law diagnoses you, but it leaves no hope. It leaves you with you. It says, good luck, Jack. And the problem is you're jacked up. Amen? And you need the medicine which is in Christ to your sinfulness. The law kills. It also enslaves it enslaves you because you're always trying to be good enough and you live and are enslaved by the law. 
trying to get a hold of it. And always it's a cat and mouse game. Jesus came and said, slaves don't stay in the house for long, but sons do. Because whom the son sets free is free indeed, and a son abides forever in the house. And there are a lot of people, they come into church and they try to do, 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 to look good, performance, and they don't know the new covenant. The new covenant is Christ, once and for all, died for your sins. Praise God. And he is giving you life and not death. That comes through being good enough through your works. But you can be enslaved to sin and enslaved to condemnation without Christ. And I think the law just makes people mean. When you are about do-gooding and works-based religion, you're so busy touching all the bases that you, and you know that to, if you leave one of those bases untouched, you've broken the whole law. And so it turns into this legalism where you're thinking, boy, that one thing is going to disqualify me from heaven. Boy, can I preach to you all today a little bit? Is this okay? This one little thing that I've done, boy. And so it's all about touching all the bases to the point where you don't know the weightier matters from the little things. And you become legalistic. And it becomes about what the preacher wears the church or doesn't, you know, doesn't have the right outfit or the right this or the right that. Instead of it all being about Jesus and us coming together to celebrate our Savior. So you're scattered. The law dazzled the eyes of these people that looked on Moses' face and it's glowing. And he put on the veil and they were dazzled, but they couldn't look intently into it. Where Christ has not come to dazzle you, he's come to enlighten you so that you can see him and have a vision of him and of your life. The enlightenment of the Bible comes through knowing Christ. You can go to churches to be dazzled. You can go to watch movies to be dazzled. Religion will dazzle you, but it won't enlighten you. It won't give you purpose and meaning. I remember two years ago I went to Spain, and I'm walking through these old churches, and they're beautiful, and I was dazzled by them, but they also seem very cold and empty. And I felt it. And I'm like, where is the spirit in this place? Where is life? Religion will give you a big old nice marble church with no life in it. It'll dazzle your eyes to see it. But there's no enlightenment. There's no vision. And that comes only through Jesus. Can't look intently at it. It's the only cursory look with the law of Moses because you're all over the place trying to do good and and it's all about ceremony and it's all about this and that and not about the one thing, the main thing, Christ crucified. But with Christ, we have purpose, we have meaning, we have life. Why? Because you're given permission to live. Why? Because he paid it all. You can enjoy your life, man. It's abundant. You have a Savior who cares about you and lays his life down for you. So much better. Help wanted is the law of Moses. It's right. It's true. Ten commandments are good. Problem is you. But help given is Christ. He is the one that shoulders the burden. He does not need your help shouldering his cross. He took it up there by himself and died on it by himself for you. Praise God. Isn't that good? Boy, you can get so distracted, dazzled by religion. And I think there's a lot of churches, they try to dazzle people. They try to have the pyrotechnics and the lasers and the this and that. To dazzle the eyes, man. To keep people coming back and be dazzled. And you've got to be more than dazzled by religion. You've got to have a personal walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. and be, And the light has to come from the inside out by the Holy Spirit. He is the light. And He is the life. Y'all remember John chapter 4, where the woman's at the well, and she's been, how many times was she married? Five times. And she said, 
And, he, and Jesus said, hey, go get your husband so I can talk to him. And she says, I have no husband. And he said, you're right, you have no husband. You said it truthfully because you've had five husbands. <laughs> and he said, and the one that you're with right now is not your husband. He said, in this, you've said the truth. And to justify herself, she goes, I, I perceive you're a prophet. She goes, now, the Samaritans say we were to worship on this hill. And uh, you Jews say we were to worship over in Jerusalem in the temple. Which one do we go to? Where, where are we supposed to go to touch that base to make sure that we're doing it right? And Jesus said, the hour has come. For those that worship, God will worship him in spirit and in truth. Speaking to the fact that it's a personal faith and walk with Jesus. Personal trust versus going to the right hill to pray. Man, religion will have you all over the place, distracted on what you, what sermon, have I gone to church enough? Have I given enough? Have I done enough? Have I repented enough? Am I enough? Man, you've got to step over yourself and look outside of yourself to the one who paid it all at Calvary and paid it all to set you free. So that you can have a life that you can enjoy. Boy, doesn't that take the pressure off? When your salvation is not based upon how many times you've been to church this year. Isn't that nice? Or how much better you are than so-and-so. Because I know you're not Hitler, but we're not comparing you to Hitler. We're comparing you to God. Okay? And you're only as good as what you're compared to. And when it comes to God, there is nobody that will, he will share his glory with. He is perfect and you're not. And if you want a relationship with him, there's always going to be this wall between you and him when it comes to do-gooding. Cannot get there. There are two ways to heaven according to this passage. Paul says there's two ways to heaven. And that is through the law of Moses or through the new covenant of Jesus Christ. You're either going to get there through your good works, which y'all are all sorry. And there is none good, no, not one. Amen? All have fallen short of the glory of God. And if you don't feel like you have, keep stay here a little longer and I'll preach some more to you. Amen. Amen. But for the rest of us who've been married five times and the one we're living with is not our spouse, you tell that person to clean up their act. They're going to look at you like it's game over already. And then it's, it turns into ceremony. Well, let's not look at my past and let's not look at how I'm doing. I'll just do some ceremonies and that'll justify me before God. I'll go to this right hill church instead of this wrong hill church. And that's going to do it for me. And you got people that come to church and in order to bury the problems that they came in with, they do little religious ceremonies on Sundays. Or they take communion. They say, oh, I did my ceremony. I'm good. No, 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 no. If it's not pointing to the finished work of Christ, if it points only to itself, it is just a thing, but not the main thing. It is there to scatter you, to dazzle you, and you walk away dull with a veil over your heart. Not seeing this book for what it is. This book is not about you. This book points only to him. People say, well, what about human responsibility? And aren't we supposed to do good and people take responsibility? Let me tell you what human responsibility did. It killed you. You are a failure, dude, if you are any kind of saved. Jesus Christ had to take something dead and make it alive. And he does that by the power of his Holy Spirit. So I am responsible enough to know who to trust in, and that is Jesus, because I am broken without him. I know what I am. And I know exactly what human responsibility got me, Jack, and a big old wall between me and God. As long as it's isolating you and putting the whole thing on you, brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, amen. But when it points to him, praise the Lord, amen. So number one, the law gives life where all the do-gooding of the Bible will end in death if it's ultimately up to you and your good works 
instead of him and his finished work. Secondly, not only is it life-giving and that it is geared toward that, and Jesus said, you guys use the law to kill and not to give life. You know what the law does, what, what Jesus does with the law is he takes it aside, he nails it to the cross, all the requirements, and he steps in its place as our mediator. And then he takes it and he writes it in our hearts on flesh, tablets of flesh, instead of tablets of stone. And though we have the law, and there is a moral code in the New Testament, absolutely, and we're to love the Lord and love our neighbor as ourselves. it's written in flesh now and not in stone, where we are full of compassion, full of tenderness and forgiveness, redemption toward others, even though we have a law written on the inside of us. But that comes by the Holy Spirit, doesn't it? And so secondly, the new covenant is spirit-empowered. Spirit-empowered. It is not empowered by the flesh, but by the spirit. He says here, if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because the glory of his countenance, which the glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the spirit not be more glorious? Everybody say more glorious. Man, the ministry of the spirit is better than self-imposed religion. Paul says in uh, Philippians 3.3, 3, For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. The new covenant is a work of the Spirit. He is the one that takes the ink off the page. And by His Spirit, He writes it in the hearts of men. The glory is greater because it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians 1.27 The hope of your life is that Christ lives in you and it is glorious. And it is more glorious than do-gooding religion. The Holy Spirit has to do a work in your heart. Ezekiel 36 verses 24 and 20 through 27 talks about our hearts being stone and God having to take our heart out and put a heart of flesh in. This is the new covenant. He gives us a new heart. It's the inward life. And it is spirit-empowered and spirit-driven. Listen to what it says. For I will, take out, I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all the countries, and I will bring you into your own land. And then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean, and I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from your idols. And I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. And I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will keep my judgments and do them. It's very important that you don't put the Holy Spirit as the icing on your cake when it comes to your religiosity. He is the one. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. It is the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit alone that causes a man to walk in his statutes. Amen. In Ezekiel chapter 36, he says, I chasten the nation of Israel. I scattered them all over the world because they would not stop worshiping idols. And even then, they profaned my name wherever they went. He said, therefore, Israel, know that it is for my name's sake that I do this and not for yours. It's for my glory and not yours. I will gather you from the four corners of the earth, and I will put in you my spirit, and I'll pull out of your chest a heart of stone and put a heart of flesh in there. It's an operation of God, not of self-imposed circumcision from the outside in. It's something that God has to do. And therefore, we trust in Him to do it and not in ourselves. Man, religion will tell you to turn over a new leaf. The new covenant says you must be born again. Some people, man, they think that they've done really good. And they 
take their good works like a pearl in their pocket to show everybody, look at my pearl. And they don't look at the bad stuff. And they think, oh, I haven't been that bad. But according to God, even your righteousness is as filthy rags right? because it's all done in pride. If it isn't of faith. It's like saying, boy, I am vintage wine. And I've only done a little bit of, I've only put a little bit of sewage in it. You know, you put a little bit of sewage in the best wine. It's ruined. And that's how God sees people. And that's why he has to do a do-over. And you must be born of the Spirit of God. New heart, new eyes, new ears, new everything. Complete rewiring, complete overhaul. The law brings you to nothing and so introduces you to God. That's how it functions. It points out of itself to the new covenant that is to come. I'm covering a lot today and I, I pray that you stay with me just for a few more minutes. I want to say that I do not believe that those that were born before Jesus had to fulfill the law under the old covenant. The Bible says that they were saved by faith just like we're saved by faith. Hebrews chapter 11 says that there's a hall of fame of faith. That the Old Testament saints are not less than we are. Do you believe that? We are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. They are our heroes and not our less thans. And they were saved by the same Holy Spirit that we're saved by. David said, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit. He, he needed the same God to do an overhaul in him that we do now. And yet, when Jesus came in the fullness of time, he was like a meteor that came out of the sky and hit the earth with such impact, it went all the way back B.C. and all the way front A.D. And the Old Testament saints that were saved were saved by looking forward to the coming Messiah. By finding their salvation in God when they pleaded for mercy when the law slew them in the Old Testament. They were saved by the same covenant that we're saved by. We are children of Abraham. Amen? He believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness just like us. As Isaac was, so are we the seed of promise, Galatians says. Moses found grace in the sight of God. How many of you know he needed grace? Yes. All of that is history. They did not know what we know in the fullness. But 1 Peter chapter 1 says the Spirit of Christ was in the prophets that prophesied concerning His coming. But those Jewish people that are works-based, like I don't believe that Saul of Tarsus was an Old Testament saint before he got saved. I believe that guy was a uh, Pharisee of the Pharisees, and he said, I do everything excellent, and he, it was all works, and it was all dumb, he said, when Jesus Christ got a hold of him. But there were some that said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And they looked to the atonement, and they looked to God, and they looked to the Messiah that was to come. But these Pharisees of the Pharisees that say, Jesus is the Messiah, but he's not the, but it's not all about him, it's all about Moses. Even today, they'll say in uh, Psalm chapter 22, when it says, they pierce my hands and my feet and cast lots for my garment. The Jewish people of today, when they read that, they don't see Jesus. They see David having a hard time with his hands and feet for some reason. And somehow got him pierced a little bit. No, nothing to do with Jesus. Jesus, nice guy. They're waiting for that political Messiah to come. Or in Isaiah 53 where it says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. They say, oh, that's Isaiah having a hard day. They don't see that pointing to something more in Christ that is to come, the new covenant. But as Christians, the reason why we talk so much about Jesus is because he is the linchpin. He is the hinge on which the whole of our... He is the strength in our weakness. He is everything. Everything points to the medicine, and the medicine is Jesus Christ. 
and His Spirit. is what empowers our life. How many of you know that your whole Christianity is based upon the power of God? Yes. It is the power of God unto salvation, His gospel. Thank you, Lord. It's not based upon do-gooding. It's based upon power. Inward power that comes by the Spirit of God alone. And that's why at the very end of this passage, he says, the law of Moses is fading away as it points to Christ. And Christ is the Son as the law of Moses has glory. It's like the stars and the moon that shines over the night. But when the Son of Righteousness comes, Malachi chapter 4, S-U-N of Righteousness, when He comes, His light shines and all of those stars and the moon fade because of the glory of the grace of God in Christ Jesus. And His shining and His light and His glory... Uh, are by the Spirit of God, it says, as we are transformed into the same image from glory to glory. So the law, if you're under the law, if you think you're going to do good, and the Bible says that you're fading out with it. But because of the Spirit, it does not fade out. It is permanent, and all you do is go from glory to glory. It goes this way when the law is going south. Amen. I may be happy about that today. Glory to God. So the life is in the new covenant. It's better because it's spirit-empowered and not you Amen. as the battery of it. It's the power that is not of us but of God. I'll give one more real quick and I'm done. Let me just run through them. The, law, the, the new covenant justifies us, whereas the law condemns us. We'll get into that next week. The new covenant is permanent while the old covenant is passing away. I'm going to be thankful it's permanent. And the word here, meno in the Greek, means it lodges with you. The new covenant was meant to go home with you and lodge with you. It's permanent. The new covenant gives hope. He says we have such hope because of... I'm going to be thankful for hope because of Jesus. The new covenant gives you vision, whereas you're not blinded, but you have a vision for and a meaning for your life because of your walk with the Lord. And the new covenant gives freedom. That sets you free from being a slave to being a son. And it's so much better, guys, than all the law keeping. And I want to encourage you, listen, follow the law and obey the law. But it is not your daddy. And it is not your mediator. It serves you. You don't serve it. It's not your master. Jesus is. So it's healthy to go to church. Amen? It's healthy to give. It's healthy to do these things. You want to grow in health? Obey God. But all of that, ultimately, you look to Jesus for the power to do, it, to do what God has written in your heart already by His Spirit. I'll just say this last thing because I, I get so excited about all this. And I'm, I know it's a lot to cover, but I like this one last thing. When it says that we have the ministry of righteousness instead of the ministry of condemnation, that's the third point. Did you know that it says the ministry of righteousness in glory? Do you know that when Jesus when God justifies you in heaven when you trust in God He justifies you. Did you know that? But He doesn't do it over in the corner of heaven. He does it in the middle of His Shekinah glory. He justifies you in glory and it is more glorious than any law keeping. The reason that we believe in the justification by faith is because it singles out the work of Christ as the one thing that justifies. But when Jesus justified you, he didn't just justify you over and say, oh, footnote, he's a little bit justified. No, he did it in all of the glory that radiated off of Moses' face. All of that glory that was on his face and then faded away. This is where God justifies a sinner in his Shekinah. And the Bible says over in Romans chapter 8, whom he knew he predestined, whom he predestined he called, whom he called he justified, and whom he justified he did what? He glorified. 
Doesn't say whom he justified. Some of them he will glorify. It's all in the aorist tense, in the past. Fornu, predestined, called, justified, glorified. Amen. It's all in the past. And your justification is not in how many times you go to church. Your justification is not in today. It's in your past. Amen. And so is your glorification. It's all attached to the glory of God in His glory and unto glory. And from glory to glory. You may be experiencing a little bit of His glory right now. More glory is to come. You may be glad that the new covenant is more glorious than the old covenant. Including the righteousness of you that was judicially declared by the living God in the midst of angels crying, Holy, holy, holy! I get so excited. I, I'm not even to my favorite part. That's, that's the sixth point. <laughs> But we'll pick up next week. How many of you like studying about the new covenant a little bit and what you have in God? Some of you don't even know it. You thought, boy, I just turned over a new leaf and really like Jesus a lot and therefore I'm a Christian. It's not good enough, brother. You've got to abandon yourself entirely and entrust yourself entirely to the good hands of the living God. That is it when it comes to your salvation from your sin. He is not the icing. He is the cake. And however he makes you look in public is the icing. When he writes his law in your heart, it's all God. And not self-imposed religion. And therefore it is of faith. And we look unto him. Maybe you're looking to him today. Not dazzled by him, enlightened by him. Looking unto him, the author and the finisher. Amen. Let's all stand up this morning. Thank you for tearing with me this morning. It's about it's a bit Jewish, this text, so maybe it's a little bit over the heads of people. Maybe it's a little Jewish for us Gentiles. But I think the point is made. We're not saved by white knuckling it till heaven. Whoever white knuckles until the end shall be saved. (laughs) And Those that were born again, but they had bad hearts. And they received the word, and there was just so much going on that it just didn't last. But we are the good-hearted, better than super-duper Christians born again. No, the Bible says whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And that new heart that God gave you, it will bear 30, 60, and 100-fold. Because there's only one good heart in that scenario, and that's the one God gives. Praise God, man. I preach. (laughs) That's all right. You trust in God a little bit, but you got to get to church and you got to go do some sacraments and you got to pray to this saint. You got to go over here and run over here and you got to be dazzled by Rome and you got to do all this other stuff and be and take pilgrimage and all this stuff. No. You want to know the glory of Christ? The Word of God was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Even the glory as of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. The glory of Christianity versus the glory that dazzles is in His familiarity. It's in His... It is in... How personal this is. How approachable this is. How much access you have. Who you are because of Him. The glory of Christ is in how personal it is to you. We beheld Him. We held Him with our hands. That's the glory that excels the glory that shone off of Moses' face. It's personal. He's approachable. And in Matthew chapter 17... His face, when he was transfigured, shone like the sun, and Moses turned to him to watch it burn. 
We got to keep turning our religion. All that we do every day, keep turning it to Christ and saying, thank you, Jesus. Everything I do is out of praise for what you've already done in the Shekinah over my life because of Jesus Christ. Wouldn't it be something if we were that blood bought? Glory to God. And we were his kids. And we and it doesn't come down to our knuckles being white. But it comes down to the Spirit of God. As by the Spirit. <sighs> Why? So he gets all the glory. We'll talk more about the new covenant next week. Let's, let's say a prayer. Father, I thank you today for your word written in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. We trust in you, Lord God, that you are doing a work in us, God, and that this power that you've put in our lives is at work in us. And it's the same power that raised Christ from the dead. And we thank you today, Lord God, that we are saved by faith in what you did and we are justified. And you declared it over us, Lord God, not out of embarrassment. And there's no second-rate Christian in this house. There is maturity, but we all come from the same DNA. We're all at some level in our glory walk. But Lord, I pray that it grow in this church and in our lives, God, as we look up and we thank you for an abundant life that you promised us and that it is on the payroll of the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And I give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. If there's anybody who does not know you today in this house, Lord, help them not to try to get to heaven through their own good works. Help them to get to heaven by faith in Jesus Christ. I ask it in Jesus' name and make it personal and let them walk out of this place with you lodged in their homes for the rest of their life. We thank you for a covenant that does not fade away but is permanent and goes from glory to glory. And we thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said amen. amen. Let's give the Lord a praise this morning. We honor you in this house, Lord Jesus. How many of you got something from the Holy Spirit this morning as you were listening? How many of you received something? How many of you are growing a little bit as you're listening to this? You're growing. Folks, bring your friends. Bring them here. And let me preach on justification by faith next week. What Jesus declared in glory over your life. Amen. God bless you today. You can come and pray with us. Go see the side room that we've been building and pray for the church. We love you today. God bless you.